Well, today's ruling did not go unnoticed at the Capitol. When Bruno was on trial back in November, ethics reform advocates hoped his case would provide momentum for their cause. In the end, however, nothing got done. And now some lawmakers are again hoping that this decision will reignite the debate for stronger reforms on the state level. Our Caitlin Ross has more on that. Today's Supreme Court decision is another stark reminder just how badly we need better ethics laws in New York State. Disappointed in the court's ruling, Squadron says New York State legislators should be held accountable where they commit the crime. That was a case that happened in federal court. It didn't happen in state court. We didn't have state laws uh, that allowed prosecutors here to focus on corruption right here in Albany and across New York State. That's what we need. Back in January, the legislature passed Senator Squadron's legislation that made conducting personal business out of your legislative office illegal. But the governor vetoed the bigger ethics package, saying he wanted more out of any ethics bill he signed into law. He wanted more, uh, but then the issues dropped off the radar screen. We haven't heard anything from anyone about it. Albany, uh, in general, we need to continue to look at ethics reform. We still have a lot of issues going on around here. And you know, I'm all for tightening it up. Both sides agree that an important part of any legislation passed should be an independent control board that can review ethics claims. We need laws that make this sort of behavior illegal. We need uh, independent, strong uh, board to investigate and also to mete out uh, penalties if, if those are appropriate outside of the court system. And we need more transparency so that it's easier to know early on when public officials are doing things they shouldn't. There are currently two bills being considered in the legislature on ethics, one that deals with corruption and another with campaign finance reform. The lawmakers are running out of time to act in this legislative session. At the Capitol, I'm Caitlin Ross. Well, joining us now in the studio to talk more about the decision and what it might mean going forward is Vin Bonventry, a professor up at Albany Law School and also the author of the blog New York Courtwatcher.com. And also former Albany County District Attorney Paul Klein is here. Thank you very much, both of you, for your time. My pleasure. Okay, so let's start first with the decision at, from a perspective of the court. Were you surprised that the Supreme Court came down this way? No, it's not a surprise. I don't think anybody was surprised with the ultimate result. That is that there's something wrong with the statute. I mean, every single judge. That's the surprise. The surprise was unanimous that this is a bad statute. Yeah, but there were a lot of back and forths about that. Well, not actually not really. There were three justices who said, get rid of the whole thing. Right. Six of them said, it's really bad, but we think we can save part of it, and we really ought to be doing that. You know, Justice Scalia, Thomas, and Kennedy said, get rid of the whole thing. It's so ambiguous. It's so vague. Nobody knows what it means. But Ruth Bader Ginsburg and five with her said, no, come on. It's pretty clear this applies at least to bribes and to kick, uh, kickbacks. Right. And that's all it applies to. Well, that actually is good for Bruno, right, Paul? I mean, that's the whole point well, here. Well, I, I would say it's, it's, it's good for Bruno to the extent that the government, when they tried the case, um, proceeded under a theory that um, there was this conflict of interest, an undisclosed conflict of interest. There was a lot of time spent on how uh, Senator Bruno consulted with lawyers on whether or not he had to disclose things. And so their position was look, there's this undisclosed conflict of interest. This serves as the basis for finding that he violated the honest services statute. And, you know, we are not required to prove a quid pro quo. That was the government's position. That position um, is not viable right now. Yeah, but now. actually spelled out in the decision, does the justices say, yeah, it doesn't, approve, it doesn't apply to that at all? Well, the, the government made that very argument in the Supreme Court. They said, uh, well, this should apply to undisclosed conflicts of interest. And uh, the Supreme Court gave that argument some pretty short shrift. They didn't spend a lot of time with it. They said, absolutely not. So Senator Bruno finds himself literally in the position of having been convicted of something that is not a crime. Okay, so he's probably having a party, right? I mean, isn't that, it seems though, it's not as cut and dried as all that. It just seems like it should be as cut and dried as all that. You know, it seems pretty cut and dry to me, but you know, there'll be some lawyers out there a lot smarter than me that they'll read this and they'll find some loopholes. Right. But I tell you, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she writes an opinion, she's very clear. That's one of the nice things about her, whether you agree with her results or not. She's very clear, you know exactly what she's saying. She made it clear, bribery, kickbacks, and specifically, not conflicts of interest, not undisclosed conflicts of interest. This is all it is, kids, because Congress 
you didn't make it clear. And really, we're doing you a favor. We're kind of deferring to you not to throw the whole darn thing out. Do you think, do you see any wiggle room here for where the, where the prosecution could actually come in and make an argument? Well, yes, because uh, I, think, I think the government is going to take the position that notwithstanding how hard they fought to get the jury charge, that they didn't have to prove um, uh, any kind of a kickback, their sort of secondary argument is, but we did, because at the trial, um, there was some evidence that um, Senator Bruno uh, gained materially because of his relationship, because of this conflict right. of interest. So they're going to take the pos position that, well, notwithstanding the fact that we argued that we didn't have to prove it, we did prove it. And so, therefore, uh, we should be allowed to retry him, even though the judge may have messed up um, the legal instructions, which was at their request, right. um, uh, even though the judge messed up the legal instructions, um, uh, we should have the opportunity to try him again because the first time we proved that, that there was, in essence, a kickback under the state gift statute. Okay, well, there are two things here. First of all, one of the reasons why they tried him to begin with at the federal level with using this statute was because the, states, the state statutes are so weak. Right. So there are a number of people now who are proposing strengthening the state statutes. They all happen to be people That's who right. are running for attorney general, yeah. which is kind of interesting. But might this actually make, could you use this then as an argument, that this, this case is actually proof that you really do need to strengthen things at the state level and, and that you, it's just, you have to do it or because you can't go back to the There's federal no level? There's no question about it. This case is saying to New York State and any other state, come up with some good statutes, because the feds aren't coming up with them. They're coming up with rotten statutes. So if New York wants to read this decision, they could probably come up with some kind of honest services uh, statute. But it's got to be pretty clear. I mean, that's just a fundamental rule of criminal law in this country. You've got to have a criminal statute that ordinary people, let alone people who are lawyered up, they can read it, and they know what's being prohibited, what's going to be punished. And the entire court is saying, you read this thing, you don't know what it's saying we're going to punish you for. Now, Paul, you actually prosecuted members of the legislature when you were in office, sure. one member of the legislature yeah. in particular, a, a former assemblyman. Yeah. And how difficult was it to build that case? Well, it, it, there, there was a paper trail, okay? I mean, the, the, and, and there was a paper trail in this case, essentially, okay? A, a voluminous one, actually. Right. The, 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 the simple the simple approach okay there's there's two ways of looking at it. you can craft a statute that in very clear plain language says thou shalt not have a conflict of interest mm -hmm. and it seems and, so clear of course well, I know, you shouldn't. But, and, and then the, the secondary question is and if you do what's going to be the penalty i mean the whole point was that the the, the federal penalties are much stiffer I mean, the legislature could craft a very simple, very concise um, statute making it, you know, a mid-level felony to, ha to engage in a conflict, um, you know, for your own gain. Now, the other side of that, okay, if you don't want to go down that particular road, if that's too difficult a policy decision, then the next policy decision you could say is, okay, it's a full-time legislature, no outside employment, it eliminates the conflicts of interest, and, and you know, pay them a salary commensurate okay. with a full-time legislature. Maybe, Paul, and I think that you make a good point. The problem is, I don't know if you caught the Quinnipiac poll yesterday, right. all right? I mean, I don't know if you saw it either, but yeah. it basically says that uh, dis dissatisfaction with the government is at an all, a state government is at an all-time high, mm -hmm. and nobody's going to want to say, let's use taxpayer dollars to make a full-time legislature to